Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, Illegal Money Lending, the Tactics, the Signs and the Response. This webcast is held jointly with the Chartered Banker Institute, Manchester Metropolitan University and ICAEW Northwest. Please note that we are recording today's webcast and it will be available to watch on demand. If you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to submit these via the Q&A box. We hope you enjoy today's webinar and I will now hand you over to our Chair of today's session, Neil McMillan. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, as Heather already mentioned, this is a, a joint event with the Chartered Banker Institute, Manchester Metropolitan University and ICAW Northwest. Um, my name is Neil McMillan. I'm the ICAW member of Council for the Northwest. And in my day job, I'm also a partner at Macmillan & Co LLP, a firm of chartered accountants based near Chorley. Um, so today we'll be covering um, illegal money lending, the tactics, the signs and the response. And I think we will acknowledge that in, in sort of times of financial difficulty, there can be an increased temptation for people to borrow money from illegal money lenders. So in this webinar, we'll be looking at illegal money lending, the tactics that money lenders use, and how employers and others can recognise the signs of activity taking place. So delighted to say we're joined today by a, a, a panel with uh, vast experience in this area. We've, we've got so Paul Baby from Manchester Metropolitan University, Kath Wollers from England Illegal Money Lending Team, and uh, Theodora Hadji Michael from Responsible Finance, who I think has just joined us now. Um, so I'll just pass out to um, perhaps the panellists individually at this stage, just to give a, a brief introduction, then we'll, we'll tip into the main part of the show. Uh, Paul, if you would give us an intro, please. Yes, uh, my name's Paul Raby. Uh, I've uh, got a few slides I'll just work through with you. Uh, and the first one is my little uh, introduction. So I've got, can you see those slides? Yes. No. No, yeah. No. Well, that's made a mess of that. <laughs> uh, let's just go again. We're there now. That's yeah. a good call. Yes. Great. Uh, so I worked for 32 years uh, in banking. Uh, mainly in customer facing roles, branch manager roles. Uh, 38 years I've been teaching banking at, at various levels uh, on the banking qualification in higher education. Uh, and I'm presently a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan. Um, and I teach on the banking and finance degree. The reason I, I've been invited on the panel is I've done some research for my PhD on the lived experience of customers of payday lenders. Uh, my main findings were, on the whole, they made fairly informed choices. They were aware of the costs involved. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the majority of them actually found the costs reasonable. They saw themselves as high risk and then expected to be charged a higher premium. They felt that they had little alternative and that the payday lenders were the least bad choice available to them. Obviously, today, we're going to talk about an even worse choice. Uh, they were embarrassed by using payday lenders. Uh, and they kept it to themselves, not telling partners, family, friends. And this made it very difficult to help them uh, once it started using payday lenders, difficult to identify, uh, largely due to this level of secrecy. Uh, and what is illegal lending? Um, the FCA, uh, once they took over the responsibility for consumer lending from the uh, OFT, defined it as lending that is not authorised by them, and not licensed under the Consumer Credit Act. So the whole regime against illegal lending isn't intended to prevent short-term family loans, helping each other out, but to protect consumers from those lenders acting without a license and without any regard to the rules. Often these are known as loan sharks. The FCA produced a report in 2017, 20-page report, um, undertaking a survey of illegal lending. It was found it difficult to get a handle on the size of the market because of that secrecy and embarrassment of using them. And also the, the, the uh, consequences maybe of disclosing. Uh, and they found 
that the uh, main borrowers were lone parents, generally mothers, very similar to my findings with payday lenders. And they've exhausted all other options. Maybe they've recently moved, they've got few contacts, or they're in a cycle of debt with no access to um, regular credit and regulated credit. Uh, they could be consumers with cultural, language, educational barriers. Um, so they, they, again, they can't access those legitimate sources of lending. Maybe the, the, the literacy is poor or maybe they've got learning difficulties. Small and medium enterprises, so small businesses, need money for the business to overcome any cash flow issues. Um, so that could be paying their employees or a small one-man band needing repairs to the vehicle. Um, those sorts of, uh, of issues where well, cash is absolutely needed then. Uh, prisoners coming back into the community. I've done a lot of work with prisoners over the years uh, through the Prince's Trust and actually um, through the Open University teaching prisoners. And this one's quite close to my heart. Uh, they, 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 they come out, they want to make amends, they, they, they want to start a life, but they haven't got any money for accommodation and they finish up back in the same cycle. And then immigrants, legal or otherwise, uh, without any access to, to any alternatives. And the consequence is because you're not regulated, the lenders don't need to apply reasonable interest rates, they don't need to quote any interest rates, where there are agreements, there are legal agreements. Um, for example, when, when uh, a parent found that his son had entered into a 5K uh, loan, the balance stood at 50K. Uh, but when the parent realised what was happening, they're not bound by any legislation for gaining repayment of the debt as well. The bank has to comply with the Consumer Credit Act when they want the money back. There's certain things they have to do. These aren't bound by that. So the, 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 the repayment methods include intimidation, duress, there's an example in the report about uh, a money lender approaching a partner outside the primary school with a baby in her arms. Uh, and death threats aren't unusual. And then repayment methods, instead of just getting the money back, if there's no money to be got, uh, there, there's examples uh, uh, and one is having to set up a cannabis farm uh, in his house. The conclusion's really disappointing. Uh, we will continue to work with our consumer network partners to keep our insights into both the legitimate and illegal markets. Ugh, not really enough. And of course, since uh, 2017, they've also effectively regulated the payday lenders out of business. So where is it left for these vulnerable customers to go? Centre for Social Justice produced a report 2022 named Swimming with Sharks, 115-page report compared to a 20-page report including appendices from the uh, FCA. Um, and again, they identified uh, that we're looking at the most vulnerable in society, which are even going to be more vulnerable now uh, with this cost of living crisis that we're going through. And just look at these percentages. 75% of users of illegal money are claiming benefits. 66% also owe money to a legal creditor. So again, squeezed at both ends. 65% uh, with a long-term health condition and all the others on there. So biggest difference between the two reports, quality of the conclusions. So the report came to 20 odd conclusions. I've just summarized a few here. Uh, one was uh, if the budget was to be raised, just a small amount, seven million pound, big day tomorrow when they're talking money. Uh, they were talking much bigger figures than that tomorrow. Uh, that could see an additional 58 arrests uh, over 3,000 victims protected, somewhere between 10 and 40 million pounds saved uh, from the victims. Uh, they also suggested the government should launch a national advertising campaign to highlight these issues and the support that's available. New sentencing guidelines, so higher tariffs, uh, and give the judges wider discretion to interpret those, those guidelines. Uh, training for debt advisors other in, and others involved in protecting these vulnerable people. And they also suggest greater uh, help to save. So this is a scheme that, that, that's available uh, and that, that in, in itself should be improved. Introduction of a nil interest loan scheme to, to wean them off the, the, the uh, illegal lenders. Uh, and this is seen working fairly well in Australia. Improved financial education and beefing up the role of credit unions, uh, including greater support by UK retail banks. So that's what, what, what the report came to. 
Uh, my own personal view on this is we need to do more than just monitor. We've monitored for years. Uh, illegal money lending has been going on for hundreds of years uh, with no real strong consequence, really. Uh, and the increase uh, in reliance by the retail banks on credit scoring mean that these customers will find it almost impossible to, to gain financial support from the banks. Uh, maybe the banks should offer direct support to those that do support this element of the population, taking that stress off the banks. Uh, credit unions, yes, there's a, a, some other fairly innovative new solutions. Give them charitable su status, support them uh, by tariff direct on the banks. It doesn't need to be a massive tariff. Uh, financial education needs to be given equal recognition as other topics at school and colleges, such as IT and maths. Uh, should be taught in prisons before release, especially for those long-term offenders. Uh, and universities should consider including financial education in the first semester on all degree courses, whether it's a financial degree or not. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was um, very sort of interesting sort of introduction into the, the yeah. theoretical context for, from a sort of academic perspective as, as to the uh, as to what we mean by illegal lending and what can be done to help identify it i'll just just at this stage if you have any um we'll have sort of the the panelists giving their sort of introductions and slides for um for the, the sort of 15 20 minutes or so and then we've probably got time for a good session on q a and that sort of thing so if you have any questions you'd like to um to pose to any of the panelists, then please could you use the Q and A function within Zoom, and, and I'll um, keep my eye on those as they drop in and and, and flag them at the right time. Um, so I think next we'll be over to uh, Kath Wallers from England Illegal Money Lending Team. If Kath, if you if you're there and you have your slides, yes, I think I'm sharing. It says I'm sharing. Am I? Looks yep, good to me. I can see nodding. This is all. This is all good. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kath Wollers. I'm the liaison manager with the England Illegal Money Lending Team, which makes it sound like I lend money illegally, but this is not actually a confession, especially as it's being recorded. Um, I much prefer Stop Loan Sharks, which is our social media handle, because that actually describes what we do. We are the trading standards team set up by the government, paid for by a levy on the legitimate consumer credit industry, who are charged with prosecuting loan sharks and removing them from our communities. Um, we set up in 2004. Before that, there had not been a prosecution of a loan shark for 20 years. Um, we've prosecuted hundreds since then. We've helped over 30,000 victims and we've written off over £92 million of illegal debt. We are very much a team of two halves. We have an enforcement team, about 30 investigators based all over the country, who work in two teams, East and West, going out, executing warrants against loan sharks, searching their properties, looking for evidence such as cash, um, records which used to be wonderful we, they all used to keep paper-based records but now more and more it's on the cloud or it's on electronic equipment we did a warrant the other week in Lancashire and between us knocking on the door and, and them opening the door they'd eaten the sim cards from their phones to try and get us to not be able to find information we had a lady recently standing in front of a pot of stew while we searched her property so they searched the pot of stew and then it was a mobile phone which had all the details and data logged in it as well I don't think she had the stew afterwards um, as well as an enforcement team we do things like um uh, financial investigations so uh, we charge loan sharks with illegal money lending as quite rightly Paul said that's lending money without authorization we also try and take away their shiny things by using money laundering legislation as well the team I manage is called liaise it stands for lead in awareness intelligence support and education so we are the softer side of the team if you like we're not the door kicker in us we are the people who go and help the victims we work with communities witnesses victims affected by illegal lending trying to put them back in the position they would have been in if Mr or Mrs Loan Shark had not appeared. We also do a lot of preventative work, trying to stop people using loan sharks in the first place and awareness raising about this issue as well. We are as well, it's worth noting a trading standards team. This tends to work quite well in some of the communities we work in where people are very wary of police. So the fact we are not the police sometimes stands us in very good stead. These are some of our victim stats from people we supported in the last year. Um, one of the ones that's not on there, but it's quite interesting at the moment, is 10% of the victims we supported last year borrowed in the run up to Christmas. So this is prime loan shark territory at the moment. We also know from the start of this year, in terms of cost of living crisis, 
for the first time ever, the highest category of reason people are borrowing from loan sharks is food and fuel. It's always been everyday living expenses, but in the past, historically, it's been one off everyday living expenses like um, school uniform or a burst tire on the car or white goods. This year, for the first time, we're seeing food and fuel mentioned most frequently. So 61% of the victims knew the loan shark before the loan. Typically, someone they went to school with, someone they work with, someone they met at the school gates, someone in the pub, someone they've known for years. One of the problems we have as a team is the vast majority of people, when they take out the loan, believe they're borrowing from a friend. So we go around with a big campaign saying, don't use loan sharks. And most of our target audience turns around and says, we're not. And that's really problematic. Also for things like debt advice, we say to people, you know, if a, if someone, a client in front of you is saying they borrowed money from a friend, there's some questions that need to be asked about that because they may genuinely believe they have borrowed from a friend, but it may turn out to be an illegal lender. And that process of them realizing it's not a friend can take up to three years from the original loan. A fifth borrowed money for over five years. Quite often the loan shark will just rejig the loan. So, you know, he will demand that much money that you don't have any money for food, so he'll lend you more. He won't even have a period at which the loan ends. It's just all merged into one. 100% had no savings, which should come as no surprise. And just over a third had gone for a legal loan. And one of the biggest issues we think is that they weren't told why they were refused the loan. And that seems to be problematic. If someone had said, we, you look like a problem gambler. If someone had said, you owe a lot of money to a friend, that might actually have triggered something with them, which might have sent them off down a different route. That's the kind of stats about the victims. But I always use a particular story of a gentleman we supported in Suffolk. And he was 17. He was a postman and he needed his car to get to work. He borrowed £250 from someone his wife went to school with. And there was an agreement that he would pay back five times £50 the next five months when he got paid. He did. Two months later, knock on the door. You owe me money. No, I don't. I paid you back. There was interest as well. You never mentioned interest. That's all right. I don't do this for nothing. You know, you owe me 200 quid. I haven't got 200 quid. That's all right. I'll lend it to you. And so it went on. And so it went on. By the time this chap came to us 17 years later, we estimated he'd paid back £96,000 for that original loan of 250 quid that he paid back as agreed. In that time, he'd attempted suicide, he'd been beaten up in front of his children, he'd lost his job and nearly lost his marriage because all he was was a loan shark victim going around the supermarket with a calculator trying to make £23 feed a family of six because the loan shark was taking everything off him. And that's what we see day in, day out. That's what these 1.08 million people are going through right now. We see a lot of illegal lending in the workplace. This seems to be an emerging trend. 20% last year of loan sharks actually borrowed, uh, sorry, lent money within their own workplace. Big ones seem to be taxi firms, also the NHS, where we see a lot of migrant nurses being targeted by illegal lenders, but also logistics firms, warehouses. It can literally be anywhere as I will show. So we had a hospital consultant in London, lent a million pounds to 90 people over six years. Um, they were all people who worked under him. They were all nurses on his ward, nurses who he had uh, managerial responsibility for. So a massive power imbalance there. So people carried on paying him. And we actually took over half a million pounds of crime off him because of the amount of money that he had made. Another example, postman from Lancashire, lent money to colleagues and people he knew in his pub, People had no idea what they borrowed or how much they paid back. Quite often victims are astonished. I was with a girl this week. We worked out that over three years, she'd borrowed just under £3,000 in lots of small loans and she'd paid back £26,000 on that money. She had no idea. She guessed about five grand when I asked her and she was astonished when we sat down. The loan shark told her she still owed 43 on that debt. This gentleman had taken £300,000 um, over four years. Loan sharks are moving online slightly before the pandemic, but definitely during the pandemic. This was actually one who targeted university students. So going back to Paul's um, example of something to be done at universities in terms of awareness raising, this would be a very good example. He didn't meet any of his victims. He was in Doncaster. He had victims in um, Sheffield and Sunderland and Stoke and London and Berkshire. He asked for their photos of ID, their income and their front door. Over Snapchat, he paid an influencer to recommend him to students for loans. Everything done by a bank transfer, um, charged 100%, but you had to pay him within a month. So if you borrow £500 on the 1st of December, you have to pay back a grand at the end of December. If you can't, which is quite likely you can't, if you needed £500 on the 1st of December, by the end of January, you owe two grand, and February, four grand, end of March, eight grand, and so it goes on. There was a man in Berkshire who had threats to burn his house down after being charged seven grand for a £1,000 loan. 
So in terms of the sector, banking and accounting, one of the things we've seen a massive increase of in recent years is loan sharks using bank transfer. They either haven't realised that makes it very easy for us to catch them, or they're just getting lazier and lazier and lazier. 60% last year of loan sharks used bank transfer to lend out the money and also to reclaim payments from their victims, mainly on faster payments from mobile phones. We have looked at the patterns of this and we have got a checklist now that people can look for in terms of what to do to spot this. As an example, did some work with a domestic violence charity where they had to verify people's bank accounts the, uh, before they could say they were eligible for a grant to escape their abusive relationship. This lady spotted a load of third party payments being paid into a lady's account. So she challenged her on it and it turned out she wasn't a loan shark, which is what it looked like. She was the victim of a loan shark and he was using her account to launder money. So he'd said to her one month when she couldn't pay, that's all right, I'll get loads of people to pay you money, you take it out in cash, you give it me. I escape the eye of the authorities and you take the risk in terms of money laundering. We've done some work with a social enterprise lender um, in terms of looking at their open banking data to see if we can spot loan sharks and we can, loan sharks and victim. So we've got a way of doing it when people are actively looking at that information. We're trying to develop an algorithm that will do that for us. We're doing some work with experience and some of the other categorization engines to look at whether we can teach a bot to actually spot loan sharks and victims through bank transfer analysis. Watch this space. The problem we then have is what we do with that. So in terms of a lender, people can tell us who they are. They have no GDPR restrictions because this is criminal activity. But in terms of the victim, they can't because the victim's done nothing wrong. So we then ask the person, the bank, whoever it is, to approach the victim, to send them an email, to send them a leaflet, send them some information to say, we're worried about you. We think you might be the victim of a loan shark. Contact this team. There's also, I think, a massive piece of work to be done around loan declines. The social enterprise lender I mentioned just now, I spoke to them this morning. They charge 70% APR on their loans. They are currently um, having 1,500 people a day asking for loans from them and their decline rate is 95%. They are only approving 5% of those loans. That's a lot of people looking elsewhere. Safeguarding families, this is why I get out of bed in the morning. We had a letter from a 10 year old girl describing how she had to hide behind the sofa when the money man came to call. We have heard this story so many times. Um, this one was a very smart cookie. She got his registration number and she actually addressed the letter to IMLT Birmingham and it got to us. And there was enough when we looked at police records, they had intelligence on him, so we got a warrant and this led to a prosecution. And this is just why we do what we do. We can help people in a number of ways. We have a hotline that's 24 hours, seven days a week, a website that has live chat on it as well. And we are on all the socials. That is me. I will not ask for questions now, but at the end, but if anyone wants to reach out, we offer training to organizations. We will come in and look at your systems. We will come in and teach you about what we know about bank transaction data and how it can help spot loan sharks and victims and how it can protect them. And we'd love to hear from more people. Thank you very much. Cheers, Neil. Thanks, Kath. That was um, sort of very, well, quite, quite shocking, really. Some of this, some of this, the, um, the stories you told there are quite, are quite frightening. And I think, you know, out of that, the, the fact that 61% of the people know the loan shark that they're dealing with already, and the sort of high instances of, of use of loan sharks for food and fuel now, with in the sort of sort of difficult times we're all facing, you can see how this, this is a problem that could really only get worse as it stands. Um, I will hand over now to Theodora, who hopefully will uh, be able to offer some. Uh, practical suggestions as to what people in these sorts of positions can do. So Fyodor, over to you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you to Paul and Kath um, for the very real and very personal stories that they told, which I think, you know, really helps bring to life um, both the impact that this is having on probably lots of people in our communities. So where I come from is on the prevention side that Kath talked about. So um, my org uh, I'm Theodora Haji Michael, Chief Executive of Responsible Finance. Responsible Finance is a membership association for the types of social enterprise lenders that Kath talked about. Uh, we also call them CDFIs, which stands for Community Development Finance Institutions. Our members are regulated lenders. There's about 50 CDFIs operating across the country and they lend to um, small businesses like those um, sole traders that Paul talked about, as well as consumers um, who, uh, which, which Kath covered. 
Um, our customers can access finance elsewhere. Um, they can't get a bank loan. A lot of times they can't get a credit union loan. And that's because they have very low or unpredictable incomes um, or they have poor credit history or a lack of credit history. And so they can't get a loan anywhere else. Because of the social mission of our lenders, they, when assessing loans, they can put weight on things that other lenders can't, um, like someone's income and expenditure through open banking. And so they can really tell if uh, the customer can afford to repay their loan and what their circumstances are. When it is affordable to, um, to give the loan, they're able to turn that no into a yes, and we see it having a huge difference on people's lives. One of the stories that always stood out for me um, from within our, our network of members is a story of a, a woman a few years ago who um, became homeless, and then while she was homeless, she found out she was pregnant, and so she was put into emergency housing. Um, she applied and was approved for a small loan from a CDFI in order to help furnish her um, her new home and get ready for the baby to arrive. Um, she, with the support of the CDFI, she was able to fully repay her loan on time and also um, was offered the option of rounding up her monthly loan repayment. So let's say she she was repaying thirty pounds a month. She was able to round that up to 31 or 32 pounds a month and deposit that one or two pounds into a um, jam jar account or a savings account. And after she repaid her loan, she kept uh, she kept up saving. Um, and when we checked in with her a few years ago, um, it turns out she hadn't needed to borrow again. So she'd been able to um, cover things like um, home improvements and uh, repairs from a leak she had from her savings account. So I think that's uh, an incredible story of not only how CDFIs are able to step in uh, when customers, when people need emergency credit, but also how they offer a long-term solution that means they might not need to borrow again in the future. Um, we know from our data that our customers, CDFI customers, look very similar to those who borrow from illegal lenders um, and, the, and the data that was in the, um, the Center for Social Justice report and some of what Kath just presented. So the majority of CDFI customers are on incomes less than 20,000 pounds per year. About half of them are in employment. About three and four are claiming benefits and more than half live in social housing. And I think what this shines a light on is that um, the shared the shared market and these overlaps show that CDFIs could really reroute people who need to use credit or use small loans to cover um, either unexpected expenses or um, just uh, an increase in expenses. You know, for example, like Kath said, we're heading into Christmas. That's a peak borrowing period for our, our members as well. So um, CDFIs are a very good preventative measure. So if we could stop um, people from going, CDFIs can stop people from going to illegal money lenders. I think if more people just knew about them as options, they knew that there were fair and affordable options out there. So we um, and our members work with Kath and the illegal money lending team. But I think there's things that everyone in the audience today and those who watch later can do just around partnering with our sector, partnering with CDFIs and signposting um, to us or working with us to grow the sector. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today because as we've heard, it's an it's an area that's quickly growing and, I, and there's lots of opportunities to take those preventative measures and reroute people away from, from harmful practices. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fido. That's very interesting and useful. Um, I think we, we, we can open up the um, the floor now to, uh, to, to Q&A if anyone's got any uh, particular questions they want to cover. And I, I do have a, a couple, uh, perhaps I can just kickstart things for. Um, I think that the first one, um, well, that was 
I think posed to CAF in terms of what sort of sentences are we seeing um, these loan sharks receiving? It, it varies. I always say there is a kind of spectrum of illegal lending. You know, you get people who lend to maybe um, 15, 20 people in their locality. They don't threaten them. They charge them 100% interest. That they're criminals. They're not doing affordability checks. They're not paying tax. They're claiming benefits quite often. But that's very different from an organized crime group who are using illegal lending to launder money and threatening people with baseball bats or worse and charging, you know, 400 million percent interest or whatever it might be. So um, actual illegal lending itself is a two year sentence maximum, um, but that's per count of illegal lending. And we can charge with multiple counts if they've been doing it for a long time. But as a team, we will prosecute for every offence that we find. So we've prosecuted for assault, blackmail, rape firearms offences in the kind of extreme loan sharking examples which obviously yield higher sentences at the lower end you're talking suspended sentences you know the 15 people and the loan shark buys the selection boxes at christmas but the main thing for the victim i think is that it stops we've never had a victim moan about a sentence because they're just so pleased they're not paying anymore okay thank you and i have another question here for um for theodora in terms of what sort of what the one one of the points we pulled out were that um, a lot, a lot, a large number of people turn to to loan sharks because they're they're turned down for sort of legitimate sources of finance, um, and often the, the reasons aren't given. So, what what sort of acceptance rates do you have on those those loans, Fedora, and and what um, what sort of level of bad debts do you typically find? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say is that um, we are seeing much higher levels of demand now because of the cost of living crisis. More people are turning to credit because their incomes aren't rising fast enough. Um, but it's it's also becoming harder to approve loans because um, expense, exp expenses are rising much at a much higher rate. Um, and so as Kath alluded to, a lot of our members are declining more and more people. Um, and um, so I, I'd make a couple of points on the back of that. One, as responsible lenders, our members are either are there, they try, they provide constructive feedback as to why um, there is a decline. And the second thing is that in addition to credit, we provide what we call wraparound services, which are advice like debt advice or budgeting advice, income maximization. Something that's had a really big impact over the past year is a, a digital benefits checker that our, our, most of our members run in the background. So as a customer is applying for a loan, um, all of the information that they provide like their personal details, um, their living situation, their how many dependents they have, income and expenditure. Um, it goes into a calculator in the background, which checks if there, if there are benefits that they're not claiming that could increase um, the amount of income they're getting. So what we found is more than seven in 10 of the customers who apply to us are missing out on benefits. And that's to the tune of about 400 pounds per month that they're not claiming that equates to about £5,000 per year. So that's a huge boost to people on low incomes if they're able to increase um, their incomings by about £5,000 per year. So what, again, what, what, and what we're seeing is that, and, and as social lenders, our members help to signpost and help the, the people, help people that apply to them apply for benefits so that they're able to claim them. And what we're seeing is that some of those customers don't need to borrow in the future um, because they have that additional income. And that is a, a way of stopping the need for credit and the, the risk of someone going to an illegal lender. Um, and I think it underpins the importance of signposting and awareness of fair and safe alternatives, because as Kath said, it's really easy to go down the legal route. So with more awareness, even if someone's not able to get a loan um, in the moment, because it's not, it's simply not affordable um, for them to repay it, what they're able to do is get some longer term support and some longer, some longer term benefits that improve their situations. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, I think again, you, as part of your um, speech, you, you gave a bit of sort of insight as to what sort of government reform you think would help 
along along this. Um, what, what where, where would you put the focus on on the government reform in terms of how it should be pitched to to deal with this? Because this is an age old problem, isn't it? That's been going on for, for hundreds of years. Yes, it is. It's not a new problem. That makes it even more frustrating in many ways. Um, I think the regulators are in a very difficult position because, of course, we expect them to regulate the legal lending. And how can you regulate illegal lending? Um, but I think, again, I think Cass points about awareness. I, I, I don't think there's sufficient awareness within the mainstream lenders. Um, Kath also touched on the, the, the number of declines. In my own research with the payday lenders, uh, customers, was a number of those had either been declined, 66% of mine that I, I interviewed, uh, had either been declined or believed they would be declined. Um, and, and we've got to do something there about how the banks deal with the declined customers. And that's where the government, via the regulators, could come in, putting pressure on the regulators to look after those customers that are, are, are declining. They, they are still customers. They still have a duty of care owed to them by the bank. Um, but the bank, are, are at the minute, the way the banks are set up, they have no uh, scope to look after these non-profitable, loss-making customers. Um, and that's a shame, really, because a lot of the banks, despite the, the, the bad press that they get, are fairly philanthropic. They have their own foundations. They support a lot of charities. Uh, and I think there is scope here for the government to, to look at the banking license and give some of the mainstream banks uh, the ability to set up almost a subsidiary company to look after these declined customers to see what can be done through different channels, uh, through just widening their support. Um, and having been in banking for 30 odd years, I actually believe that the majority of people within banking would welcome that, in that ability to actually go that, that little bit further with the customers to help them through these really difficult times. Um, I left banking uh, just after the financial crisis to come into full-time education. Uh, and one of the reasons I left was, uh, at the time, I felt there was only so many times you could tell people they were going to lose the house. Uh, and it, it can be quite difficult. Kath will know, dealing with them directly. Theodora will as well. It can be quite stressful, getting involved in, in the lives of these people. Uh, and I just think that if the banks were given another option within their own umbrella, to help these customers. Uh, I think the government could do something there around the banking license, around the regulators, uh, realising that they have a duty to the declined customers as well as to the shareholders and the employees and other people that take their share of the profits. I think that's an interesting point, isn't it? At, which point, at what point does the bank's duty of care? Absolutely. And, and I think you're suggesting that uh, perhaps an extension of that duty of care should be either incorporating the banking code or whatever to, yes. to almost um uh, you know so, signposting what 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 should should the bankers be looking at the banks would say that they do this uh and leaflets are given at the time um to, to customers that are declined uh so they are signposting but I, I would just like them to have their own internal routes where they could do a little bit more um, I know it goes contradictory to what the banks are doing at the minute, pushing more and more online and less face-to-face uh, -face interactions. Uh, and again, that, that's something that, that's possibly a topic to discuss here as to whether that is leading to other issues. Uh, but I, I would just like them to have their own internal in-house uh, support function that they could pass these to. Okay, I mean, I'll just pop over to the, the Q&A function now. I've had a couple of questions pop up. And I think the, the first one is from a, a chemist, Salum. And um, it's, I don't think it's a question per se, but I think it is perhaps a useful uh, sort of soundbite, which might generate some more discussion in that um, Paul suggested on his conclusion that more needs to be done in terms of regulations to tackle illegal lending. Um, now, although I agree with him that 
more stringent regulations are needed to protect consumers from loan sharks and likes. I believe that in addition, decent work and the increase in living wages can also help keep people away from predatory lenders. <laughs> so I think is a, well, that's a fairly broad, uh, broad question. Yeah. Uh, do, do we find it is a, it is a shortage of, of income that pushes people down these sorts of routes? Or is the issue more almost in the, the education that these people are receiving uh, themselves that, um, they, you know, do they do they work through the available source of legal finance before trying this, or are they or do they tend to be easily persuaded and that sort of thing? I'll start if you like, and it was Please. directed at me. Um, uh, no doubt, no doubt, Be better uh, jobs, better paid jobs. Uh, be interested to see what happens tomorrow. An increase in that minimum uh, living wage may help. Um, but I think there's an implication in the question that, that, that um, that's the only problem. And I don't think it is that. Uh, I, I've realised I have a little concern of my own that, that life gets in the way. Um, I, I, and people will always have one off. Um, issues, one-off problems. That taxi driver needing to repair his car will always need money to repair his car. Financial education could help him to, to put money aside so he's got some saving to do that. Um, so I, I, I don't think it, it, it's purely that. And of course, those, those issues are far outside our, our, our discussion today. But I think it is around financial education um, and making facilities available for them. It always seems that those in the most need have the fewest options. Uh, and, and that's where I would like to see some address, if you like. So. Yeah, I totally agree. If I could just come in on the back of that, um, that, yeah, I think that credit can never be a substitute for income, um, but we have to recognize that... Um, that the need for credit is real and it's part of everyday life. I, the majority, more than 90% of UK adults have some sort of credit facility. We've all used it. Um, and what's really important is that when people need to use it, whether it's you know to buy a home or whether it's to fix a washer um, or buy a car seat for your kid, that you have really good options available and you have choice. and. Um, what we're seeing, what Paul said, and what we're seeing is that those uh, on the lowest incomes have the fewest choice and then pay a disproportionate poverty premium um, on top of that, which which then perpetuates the cycle. So, um, and that's what our sector is here to do is to provide that increased choice, increased good options for people when they need it when they need to fall back on it because um, you know there's been something unexpected happen. Yeah, I think that that poverty premium actually is a very um, sort of important point, isn't it? That it does affect uh, disproportionately those who have less to start with. I have another question in the, in the Q and A, um, which was I mean, obviously given. I think quite a few of our attendees are, are likely to be students, I think, as well. In the, you know, given the cost of living crisis, is there any data on students' current and future use of illegal lending? Not kind of specifically, um, but what we have seen is an increasing number of younger people using illegal lenders, and that tends to be around the social media um, element of it as well. So if you go onto Reddit or um, Craigslist, you will be able to find a loan and there won't be affordability checks done. It won't be a regulated lender. There is a money forum on Reddit where you can go on and people will offer to lend you money. And that, I think, is where the student market is expanding, if I can use that phrase. And I think there, there is a real issue with that, that we don't know this, what this looks like in lots of different sectors of community. It's such an underreported crime. It's such a hidden crime. You know, we, we often get if we go to try and do some work in Blackpool, for instance, Blackpool police will say, well, how many loan sharks are there in Blackpool? I have no idea that that's why we're here sort of thing. So there isn't the data, but I think the, the prevalence of it, the increasing prevalence of it on online forums is problematic, I think, particularly for the student population. What's the policing like of the online? I guess you know, sometimes the 
the the sort of prevention measures are, are behind, aren't they? The, the current trends, and you get the social media stuff uh, taking off, and, and you know how how sort of tech savvy are the people who are keeping an eye on this sort of thing. I, it's hard to do. Sometimes it's Facebook and it's closed groups, and it, you know it's it's hard to do that. I think, and and we get it a lot as well in WhatsApp groups, which tend to be particularly maybe amongst uh, migrant communities, where, for instance, you know people have come over from Zimbabwe to work, and the illegal lenders in Huddersfield with victims in Stoke and, and everywhere else, and the thing that's in common is is the country of origin, and there's all sorts of social chat going on in this WhatsApp group as well. But in amongst that is someone lending money, and then it's very much about shaming people if they don't pay. It looks very different in a way to your traditional loan shark who will knock on your door um, and, and threaten you with the heavies, potentially. So I, th I think, you know, it, it does vary. Sometimes they shut down really quickly, sometimes they're not. But it's volume, isn't it? It's like with anything. It, it's really hard to moderate, I think, things like that online. It has to be a bit more of a case of buyer beware than anything else. Um, I have another question, a um, couple of questions pop up here. Um, Kath, um, it sounds like you have quite an interesting job. I, I hope I argue slightly more interesting than mine. Um, could you give us some background as to how you got into this? Um, and also perhaps give some advice for anybody who wants support. Yeah, sure. So um, I have a weird job history. I worked for housing and then I worked for what was called Sure Start back in the day, which was um, a labour initiative targeting children in deprived areas. Um, I worked for that in, in Stoke and then I worked for local trading standards and then I came into this in 2008. Um, it's a weird one because the enforcement team on our team are very much ex-police, ex-investigators. My team, we've got debt advisors, housing officers, counsellors, um, safeguarding professionals, a variety of, of backgrounds as well. Anyone who kind of wants to support us, I think just get in touch. I will put my email in the chat in a second. Um, and if you think that, you know, this is something your organisation could help with or you could help with in the future, um, in terms of looking out for it, that then give us a shout. For the students as well, we developed um, an online video for students and as a response to the social media Snapchat lender that we, that we put in prison. And it's, um, it's one of these films where you can have options and you can pick where the story goes. So when I was a kid, it was books, you know, and you got to the end of page six and it said, if you want to follow Rover into the woods, go to page eight. If you go home for your tea, go to page 12, but it's on, on screen. So you watch a scene and then you click on an option to see what happens next. And it follows a student who borrows 120 pounds for a mobile phone bill. And he borrows it off someone one of his friends recommends on Snapchat. And you can make decisions as to whether you borrow the money or you don't. And then what you do after that. I don't want to spoil it at all, but you can end up in very different places depending on the, the, the choices you pick. It takes about 25 minutes to do it. It's, it's really well done. It's really interesting. So I'll put the, li the link for that on as well. And I think share that with your mates, have conversations about it. One of the biggest things we find is a barrier to people coming forward about loan sharks is that we don't talk about debt. And even if we do talk about debt, this is the last debt that people will admit to. And that's, that's problematic. So anyone who wants to do a little bit of support, just talk about this, talk about this today and say, do you know what a loan shark is? Do you know they're prevalent in England? Do you know the targeting students? Okay, thank you. I've got an interesting question really as well in terms of, um, you know, where, where does the panel stand in terms of on um, payday loans, which, uh, you know, I guess there's a lot of companies out there doing payday loans that are, uh, expensive but are they do fall within in the regulated sort of band of lending so what, what, what does the panel think of whether there should be more availability of payday loans as a, as a solution to this perhaps i'll take this first because it, it is a little bit of my subject and my, my view is a little bit different to most people uh, and i actually feel there is a role in the market for the payday lenders uh, i do think they need to be regulated uh, but I think they need to be regulated differently. Um, so the way that they lend money, typically short term, and if the customer that they're, they're supplying is honest and they can afford to repay it on that day that they say they can, uh, then it works well. Um, but where it falls down is when the, the, the customer hasn't told the truth and they are desperate for the money, so... They manipulate the, 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 the responses. So when it comes to payment, then they haven't got that money to pay. Uh, and then the default charges come on and all the rest of it. The FCA try to limit the amount of, re, uh, uh, of default charges and the number of re-sign-ups that, that, that they could do. Um, but I think there is a place 
for something like payday lenders. Um, but the regulation of them needs to be a little bit different. Making them quote the APR, for example, which is the annual percentage rate. So if you're lending somebody uh, money for a week, you've got to annualise that £10 fee as if you lent them the money for a year. So if you've only lent them £100, say, uh, for a week, then you've got to multiply that £10 by 52, and then you've got to add on the interest. So the APR doesn't make sense to payday lenders. So you've got to find a different way to, to regulate these. But I, I do believe there is a place for them in the market, providing, of course, that they are reputable. And again, this links to my previous point. If the retail banks had a payday lender arm, call it something else, that, that, then that could work really, really well. Um, but yeah, a, a bit of a different view than most people would have, I think. Yeah, I think as yeah, I think as Paul said, um, I come from this is from a slightly different point of view, um, and yeah, I, it's it's important to note that over the past three years or so, there's been a drop of about eighty six percent in terms of the lending that payday and high cost regulated high cost lenders do, and that's as a result of poor practice. Um, that they've taken and, and regulation regulatory clampdown on that poor practice around lending when it's not affordable, how they get the money back, um, how the the loans are, are sold, and so on. I think there it's fundamentally difficult to lend um, to this part of the market um, commercially with commercial incentives because it's a part of the market where it's more likely that customers will encounter financial vulnerability or difficulty. And then it comes down to, well, how do you, um, how do you handle those cases and how do you treat those customers in a really fair way when it goes wrong? Um, and I think it's very difficult to balance the commerciality of that with good customer outcomes. And that's an area where the social lending sector really excels. Um, that flexibility that they offer, um, that they can take a longer term view, that ultimately their incentives, the reason that they're lending is to help the customer be better off. And so they can be a bit more patient. They can um, be more flexible in terms of offering repayment holidays um, and so on. The other thing that are, which I've alluded to, which and spoken about which um, CDFIs do, which commercial lenders don't, um, is are these wraparound services, access to advice, um, access to budgeting support, um, access to income maximization, the access to the savings accounts I mentioned in, in the first example. None of these um, are, they're not um, making any money, uh, these these wraparound services, it's not like they charge a fee for them. Um, so again, it's difficult for a commercial lender to, to offer those. But what we see is that those resilience building products vastly improve the loan repayments. So th they do make a difference on, on someone's resilience, on someone's confidence, on their ability um, to manage uh, their money and, and feel in control of their finances. Um, so that's why I think uh, for this for, for this segment of the market, um, a bigger social lending sector is a big part of the solution. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I, th I think just one of the points that uh, Kath mentioned that uh, sort of caught my attention was the was the NHS um, sort of scenario where there was a, a consultant lending sort of vast amounts of money to to employees of the NHS. I mean, what sort of um, what can employers do more of to to address this issue? And I guess a lot of it may go on without the employer's awareness. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's when it does that, 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 you know, that they take action. I think there's lots of things. So we offer training for um, anybody. And one of those sessions we will run is for HR staff. So we've done it with uh, companies. John Lewis have done it with us um, and a couple of others. FedEx have done it too, where we will go in and sort of say, you know, if there is an employee dispute that you are dealing with as an HR team, could it be about money? There's, these are the things to look out for. But I think before it gets to that stage, 
we promote things like, you know, you can look at payroll deduction schemes that you can set up with credit unions or other providers so that people have um, access to, to savings, even if it's a small amount of money. And, you know, there's, there's lots of evidence about how good payroll deduction is because it goes out before you get it. So you don't notice it as much. You know, if you have money coming into your account, then it goes out for savings. You're much more likely to stop that than if it's done through a payroll deduction scheme. So I think there's, there's various things they can do. And sometimes it is just awareness raising. So sometimes it is, you know, having us in, having information available for staff and making sure that people are aware of the support that's available so they don't bury their head in the sand a bit. Thank you. I've just I've got another question uh, from the floor, which was um, uh, an awful lot of these new cases involve the use of social engineering by lenders to sort of nudge vulnerable people in taking these sorts of loans. Uh, the question was, you know, what, what's being done to, to better protect consumers' personal data in this regard? To avoid them being, being targeted in the first instance. Yeah, I mean that might be a better a better question for Theodora. I don't know because um, a lot of the the people that we work with are below that radar. We're not we're not in personal data kind of world. It's it's much more um, friend talking to a friend. So I don't know if Theodora can answer that a bit better than me. Sorry to pass the book. Difficult question. <laughs> it is a difficult question, and I I don't think I can answer it directly either. I know um, so what our members do as um as responsible lenders as social lenders is always a, involves a level of transparency and requiring consent from the customer to use their data requiring consent to use their open banking and being clear about how it's going to be used um so obviously there's cases where lenders don't do that whether they're legal or illegal um so i think it's a part of it is about raising awareness uh, so the customers do go to lenders like responsible lenders that are going to be transparent are going to build um literacy and awareness about you know what data what how your data should be used properly in in the lending process which can can help um, mitigate against you know future um encounters where you know a customer can recognize okay this doesn't look right um you know I, I'm not going to engage with this this lender because they don't seem like either they're operating fairly or they might be operating illegally. So I think, yeah, from our perspective, maybe it goes back to the the awareness raising side of of how lending should be done transparently and with the customer's best interests in mind. Paul, did you have anything to add on that one? Uh, just going back again to to financial education and making sure that people are aware uh, that the their data is really, really valuable. Um, and people want their data. Um, uh, and then just a bit of education around um, what a legal approach looks like and what an illegal approach looks like. And of course, they all saying if it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Uh, and then the GDPR regulations are in there, but um, they, they, they need more testing in this area particularly, yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. I think we're going to get cut off in about two minutes time. So I'll, I'll just wrap up there and summarise that uh, we had a very interesting, you know, hours chat on, on recognising the signs and what can be done to raise awareness. Um, and also, you know, flagging some instances where you wouldn't think there was an issue, uh, you know, again, such as the NHS story. Um, and, you know, we've, we've also covered things like payday lending, and also the banking industry's response and what can be done or, or where they maybe could bolster their approach into this, which has all been very interesting. So I'd just like to say um, thank you very much with every, for everybody for, who attended. And um, it's been, been very insightful. So I think we were done on all the questions. So um, thank you to Theodore, to Paul and to Kath. Thanks You're very welcome. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.